Hi, everyone. Welcome. And you are now at the webinar that's called Now You Are a New PI, What's Next? This event is a proud collaboration between the Botanic Society of America and the Plant Postdocs. Both groups aim to provide resources and support for early career stage researchers, and I highly encourage you to, to become a member of BSA and the Plant Postdocs for future events and opportunities. And this is our first webinar for our collaboration, and we have more planned for the future, so please stay tuned. My name is Minya, and I'm one of the organizers and moderators for today. Currently, I'm a postdoc at the University of Connecticut, and I'm starting a tenure track position next spring. So I'm as invested in this webinar as you all are. And now I will leave some time for my co-organizers slash moderators to introduce themselves. Thank you, Minya. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for attending uh, this webinar. We are so excited to have our four panelists today. And my name is Ariadna Gonzalez Solis. I am a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I am also a member uh, of the leadership team of plant postdocs. And as Minja was uh, mentioning, we are a community of, of plant postdocs and early uh, career scientists. And the main goal is to help each other in our next move, try, uh, finding uh, opportunities and jobs in academia and in industry. So it's been really great to have all these resources and sharing them with all of you. You can find more information about, about plant postdocs in our website, plantpostdoc.com. And yes, as Minya was saying, please don't hesitate to reach to us and to become a member. We have a Slack, we have Twitter, we have different ways to share our resources. So please uh, reach out. And yeah, I will be also moderating uh, this event with Minya. And so now, uh, Israel, if you want to introduce yourself too. I mean, no need to, but hello everyone. Welcome. I'm Israel. I'm a postdoc at New York University and I'm working with Minya and Ariadna for this webinar. I hope you have a good time. Thank you. Okay, a few more logistics before we get uh, get everything started. As you are aware that this event will be recorded and I hope you're fine with it. And we will first let our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And we have five questions prepared to ask them. Then we will open the floor to you. These five questions were gathered from your sign-up forms, and they were the five mostly frequently asked questions. So before our Q&A se session, please stay muted. And during our Q&A se session, you can either raise your hand, unmute yourself, or you can type your questions in the chat. And because so many people signed up for the event, we gathered a lot of questions from the signed up forums. It's not possible for us to cover all of them, so we apologize in advance. However, many of you submitted questions about how to land a PI job, including how to prepare the interviews, negotiation, and so, so on. We have actually already planned another webinar later this year, specifically talking about startups and negotiation. So please stay tuned. But for today, we will be focusing on the phase that one has already become a PI and trying to navigate their first year or so. Okay. That's enough talking from me, and I will leave the stage for our panelists to introduce themselves. And you guys can just start jumping. <laughs> I can start. Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Arif Rashaf. I'm a plant cell biologist. I'm an assistant professor currently at Howard University. Um, I introduced myself with the plant and the beautiful uh, world of the plant cell biology when I was a graduate student. We started working with some polarized protein and cell division. I followed that path and make a very polarized career towards other polarized protein when I was a postdoc uh, and continue doing the cell division. Uh, so my lab, uh, now I force all of the people in my lab to do more cell division. Uh, so uh, this is pretty much me. And I started my position just eight months back. So many of these struggles and happy moments that is still fresh in my mind. Uh, uh, so I'd be happy to talk about these things today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Coughlin. Um, I typically use they, them pronouns, but um, anything is fine. I'm an assistant professor at Yale University in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And we study how new species form um, and how they adapt to their environments. 
using both evolutionary genetics and evolutionary ecology. So I started my lab in the summer of 2022. So this is uh, going on my two-year anniversary. Um, and I think you guys also wanted some information about how big our groups were when we started and, and now. So when I started um, the fall that I started, uh, a graduate student and a postdoc joined the lab. And now um, we've grown very large, uh, very quickly. So we've got um, three graduate students, four postdocs, a part-time lab manager, and then a, a incoming tech. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's big. I can go next. Um, I'm Jess Gersony. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an assistant professor at Smith College, which is a PUI or a SLAC, um, a liberal arts school. And I started at the exact same time as Jen. So this is my finishing up my second year. Um, and when I started my lab, I had one very, very minimal part-time undergraduate Um this past year, so my second year, I had a postdoc, a research technician, and five undergrads. And then this coming year, I'll have a master's student, a, a PhD student, a postdoc, and four undergrads. Um, and we study, I should say, I'm a plant physiologist. I love the flow. Em. I'm also open to other physiology, but I'm biased. Uh, I study it specifically in mature trees in northeastern forests, primarily thinking about climate change. And I also have been thinking a lot more in the lab's been working on like art science integration and integrating um, like DEIJ into our culture and pursuits. So that's me. Great. And so I think that makes me the elder. Um, I'm uh, Sam Leboff, and uh, you can use he, him for me. Um, I started my lab in April of 2020. So uh, um, yeah, anyway, a, um, a little bit, uh, uh, I have much wisdom to share. So I'm at Oregon State University uh, in the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology. And my specialty is genetics and gene expression dynamics of leaf and floral development. Um, and I mostly work on maize and other grasses. Um, and when I started in 2020, um, I started with a postdoc, a PhD student, and a master's student. Oh yeah, and one undergraduate. Um, and now uh, we're we're going strong. We have one uh, postdoc, three PhD students, and six undergrads in the lab. Thank you so much. Oh my God, our panelists are so great. Okay, our first paper question, which I also type in the chat is what did you prioritize in your first month, quarter, or year? I can pick someone to start with. Let's start with Sam. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, so then I think that the first month, you really have that feeling of like, what am I doing? Who, who, how do I do anything? And so I felt like the first month was really administrative training. Um, like how to order things, how to get the greenhouse space set up or the field set up, how to get the right permits, how to get keys to the, the building, how to make sure people can get there after hours, um, doing all the safety paperwork. Wow, there's just so much safety paperwork. Um, and then in the first quarter, um, I'd say that um, it would be really good to learn who to email if X happens, you know, like if something breaks, who do you email um, if there if there's like an emergency and something needs to be mopped? Like who do you email? Um, who do you get uh, budget help for? Um, how do you get students enrolled in your class after the deadline? Um, just like uh, just knowing who to contact, like that's really really a good goal for the first quarter. Um, and then the, and the first year I feel like was all about getting the lab running sort of um, all, making sure that we had all the things, um, the equipment, um, especially large equipment purchases are going to take a long time. There's a lot of paperwork, especially if you're at a land grant institution and there's sort of state mm, mandated process. Um, it'll take a really long time until you're you're running. Um, and so I felt like, okay, the year was about getting microscopes and reagents and machines and even little desk organizers and, uh, you know, picking which tubes and tips and um, pots in the greenhouse. Um, just so many little decisions in the first year. Yeah, I can jump off that. I think that was super well said. 
<laughs> and is very true. And I guess the, the things I could add to it is for me, the teaching was a huge thing the first year where I really was kind of just like, research is pretty much on pause. Like I'm finishing up older projects, but I am like developing the courses. That was, mo I would say 90% of my time of my first year. Um, and then also I spent a lot of time that year, but also the year before, because I, I had the position, but then I deferred for a year. So I had this nice year where I could like kind of think a lot. And I really was trying to spend time re like doing some like imagination work in terms of like, these are what the labs I've been in have looked like. And like, what do I want my lab to look like? Like, how do I want it to be different? How do I want it to be the same? What are my values and how can I center those? And so there was a lot of work around that for me. Because I think it's really, it would have been, I could have just been like, okay, we're going to do a very traditional plant physiology lab. And I would have had a lot of fun and I would have loved that a lot. But I also have the artistic practices and also want to like bring in more community engagement into the lab. So trying to figure out like what that could look like. Even it's as simple as like making a website and being like, okay, what are our lab values? Like what are, what do we want to work on? So that was really exciting and really, really fun and gratifying. I liked that part of the first year. And then, yeah, otherwise, just, yeah, ordering equipment. Um, yeah, I, just echoing all of that, um, definitely also where my mind was at this first year. Um, I maybe would just add, I feel like a lot of us um, are in many ways sort of perfectionists or are, um, you know, sort of high achieving type A type of people. And um, for me, I think like actually in hindsight, the thing that I should have been prioritizing this first year was like just surviving. Um, it's a lot. You'll be busier than you have ever been um, at, at any point in your career so far. And you've been busy in your career so far. So um you know, trying to prioritize like what is important to you versus what's necessary. And then really like focusing on that quadrant of important and necessary um, is really, really useful. Another thing that might happen to you is that, especially in that first and second year, um, you're kind of like new and shiny on the seminar circuit. And so you might get asked to give a lot of seminars. Um, and it's okay to say no. I think that People told me that before I started and um, I didn't believe them. Um, it's really hard to convince yourself that it is in fact okay to say no or to say like, ah, oh, that's awesome. I would love to come give a seminar and book this year. Like, but please keep me in mind for next year um, because those things can really add up. And um, yeah, the travel is is pretty intense when you're already also trying to do teaching and um, and getting the lab started. Yeah, I'll go next. I think I forget one part. When I started, I was pretty much one man army. Uh, I had nobody in the lab, which was good and bad in many ways. But then my lab is still to grow up. I have graduate students coming. I have a full-time lab tech, a bunch of undergrads. Uh, so I, I'll tell the when I came here, I entered the lab space. One of the things I was just imagining, what is the basic things I need to start getting the data? Uh, and so there are two major things. One is few things we can just purchase right away or immediately. Uh, but there are many loopholes, uh, which I figured out over the time that sometimes we have to get the purchase order. Sometimes if it is a big ticket item, we have to go through all this bidding and stuff. So as Sam mentioned, that sometimes it takes way longer time than we expected. And other thing I'll say, there will be millions of demos and you will be the only person who can actually deal with that. So for example, I wanted to get the epifluorescent microscope. That guy literally brought all these parts to so him and me the whole day. We put it together and then we had lunch together and then we assembled, deassembled it. So all of these things, there'll be no second person in the lab. So uh, you have to be the only person to be available. Other thing I'll say that it's a lot to do on the grant writing and things and to know the people, because even if you write the grant, you are not the person who is submitting. There is final click going from the university grant office. So they have to memorize your name that, okay, this is the person. So every time um, I think I was bugging many people, every time they see me, I see my email, they, I know they kind of feel like oh, here he comes again. Uh, but you have to be on top of them in a way that the moment they see uh, my email, they know that they have to get it done. This is that with the admin people because they don't see our agency the way we see. Uh, 
but I think the most of the most important things I realized to get things done uh, on time. And other things I realized very super helpful because probably what you are doing, uh, you are doing it for five, 10 years. So you are kind of a uh, very frontliner on this understanding of this topic. But when people start joining in lab, no matter how many times you tell them, they will not be as passionate about the topic we're studying. The best way to do that, uh, ask them, okay, can you just write a review article or something and give them five, 10, 20 papers, right? So this is the best way they start thinking with you and the thought process and the whole philosophy and the science of the lab. Um, I still didn't finish a year, uh, but I felt like the purchase, uh, thinking about the grants and also thinking about how people will actually synchronize with the lab goal uh, in the science and the philosophy. I think those are the most important things. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And just to continue talking a little bit more about how finding this balance when you're just starting. Um, the second question is also here in the chat, and I think you've been already talking a little bit about this, like because now you not only have to be dealing with your research, but also with teaching, but also dealing with administra administrative tasks. So how did you manage all these? Who did you reach out to get help or to, you know, like, how did you all do that? So please, if you want to go the same order. Okay, so then uh, I'll hop in as the first. Um, yeah, so it really is a, a challenge to manage all these roles. And I think that that's not something that I really anticipated as much uh, transitioning from a postdoc to faculty, you know, like, as a postdoc, you have a lot of sort of freedom to engage in things and then step away. Like, okay, I'll I'll teach a, a workshop, but then I'm done with that. Like, it's not going to just keep coming back over and over and over again. And um, when you're a faculty member, those um, those different roles they're they're forever. They just keep coming. Uh, uh, you're always going to be thinking about you know when you're teaching again, when the next uh, proposal is due, when the next uh, sort of set of paperwork is uh, due to agencies or or uh, to the university. Um, and I think that one thing that I really want to um, emphasize here that we don't often talk about is that um, uh, you also really need to establish and then maintain great connections uh, like within your institution and uh, with your colleagues at other institutions. So it's there's really just like a lot of plates that are constantly spinning all the time. Lots of things that you have to juggle. Um, and um, so then we, we've we talked about it a little bit. And I think, Jen, they already mentioned one of the things that I think is really important is to just really ruthlessly triage tasks and responsibilities. And, and just sort of, um, I think it's really nice because it, it puts you back in control too. If you, if you set up a system of triage and you stick to it, um, I think especially while you, you have new people in the lab um, or uh, you're, you're uh, teaching a new class, that there's just like a million little things that are just going to keep coming up, a million little emails that you have to, that urgently need you. Um, and so you really need a system to, to, to figure out what's important and has to happen right away and what um, can be scheduled for later. Um, and so then um, I think Jen was specifically mentioning um, the, um, the idea of the Eisenhower matrix. And so I've written it down right here. The idea that, um, you know, there are things that are important and there are things that are urgent. And those are the ones that you do ASAP. Uh, things that are uh, important but not urgent, those are the ones that you schedule for later. Um, unimportant things that are urgent, well, you try to dodge them if you can or delegate to someone else. And then if it's not important and it's not urgent, even if you really, 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 really want to do it, you should probably say no. You should probably not do that. It's it's a procrastination to do it. Um, and so um, that, those are the rules that I try to live by. It's really hard to be consistent about everything. But um, having some sort of triage system where you sit ahead of time and say, this is what I find important right now, and this is what I find unimportant, um, will help put you in control, which is very important. <laughs> 
I'm obsessed with that matrix. I'm going to draw it <laughs> and put it on my wall. <laughs> I have not had that matrix and I think it would be very useful. I am generally not a very organized person. Minya knows me very well. She can affirm that. Um, but I guess the two things that I would say is I felt like I got hit by a bus every day my first year. Like I was so tired. I like would come home. I like couldn't even call my mom. I was so tired. And so the first year was really just kind of getting through it. But relatedly, I think is like this, we're talking about the balance of all the different things, but then also like the balance of like your humanity, I think is really important. And so I set pretty firm 40 hour a week work weeks and I stuck to it my first year and my second year. And it, you know, sure, like I'm probably writing less or like, you know, there's trade offs, but it's it's the only way I could have gotten through it, I think, honestly, because those 40 hours are so they're so intense, like Sam was describing with all the different plates you're balancing. Um, I my second year, I'm getting better at delegating. And I'm very, very, very proud of myself for that, because I think that's really hard and like trusting people and all. Yeah, because I am a perfectionist and trying to navigate that energy and like putting it aside and so like I had my technician kind of manage all the undergrads this last semester. That was life changing because I didn't have to like get the samples and plan everything out and email everyone and deal with when they're sick. What do we do? So that was huge. And then I just was supposed to go do a tree ring training course that I was really excited about, but it wasn't necessary for me to go. So I delegated my postdoc wanted to go. I was like, OK, yeah, you go instead of me. And I was like, whoa that I'm learning. <laughs> so yeah, I'd say delegation, setting boundaries, if possible. I know I'm in a very privileged position to be able to do that. And not everyone, you know, everyone's life is really different. But for me, setting those boundaries has been really useful. Yeah, fully, fully agreeing with everything that's been said. Um, I don't have a lot to add except to really echo the sentiment of being kind to yourself. Um, so, you know, I think like a lot of us are are very mindful of uh, mentorship and and being good mentors. And I think for many of us, um, it's easy or at least easier to afford our mentees grace uh, when they're learning. And also the, the recognition that like you too are learning to do something that you have never done before. And it's hard. It's really hard and it's really stressful and you will put that stress on yourself, but you'll also feel that stress from others. And so trying to sort of maintain that kindness and that growth mindset as you develop is, is really important. Also just really important for your own like mental health um, as you sort of navigate these first few years. And the other thing I just wanted to add about the delegating, 100% definitely true. <laughs> Please do it. Save yourself some time. Um, also, it might take you a little bit of time to develop those relationships with people in order to be able to delegate. And also, um, you know, like now you you have sort of seen that many of us are building these larger lab groups. And so you have this hierarchy of people who've been there and have different experiences. And that can be really helpful for mentorship within the group. But it takes time and it takes time for those people to also build relationships and feel safe and vulnerable with each other in order to be able to like ask questions. And so I think like when I first started, I was like, why aren't you guys talking to each other about this or that or whatever? Like we have an expert in that. We have an expert in this, like talk to each other. And I wasn't really clicking in that like, oh, no, they don't they don't know each other yet. Like we're all just learning to know each other right now. And that just takes some time to sort of build healthy relationships. So try to be patient and also try to be kind. Yeah, I'll quickly answer on that. I think all of them actually covered many of the important topics. So uh, I divide how I manage all of this role, like the teaching or the service and then uh, research, of course, running the lab and also some lots of admin stuff. So uh, I had to teach cell biology. So I went to my department chair and said that, can I have my classes scheduled Monday as early as morning possible? And she said, why? I said, I just want to get it done in the early Monday morning. So on that case, I'll force myself to do whatever lecture preparation on the weekend I need to. And then once I'm done with that, I have immediately after that, the office hour, I'm done with that. After that, I'll be in the lab and I'll be always in the lab. 
uh, in a sense, because I feel like if you walk into my lab, you will never ever be able to distinguish who is the PI, who is the student. Uh, I feel it's very easy when I'm working. I just tell them, oh, do you want to see how I do it? And they just watch it, right? And next time I just let them do it and I watch it. Uh, so in this way, I think like I kind of time box the teaching and all this stuff. And in fact, like I run a workshop as part of my service. Uh, it's called Microscopy Monday. And I went to the department chair and said that, oh, I need the auditorium on Monday. She said, why Monday? I said, it's Microscopy Monday, so I need to do it on Monday. So I just somehow manage everything one day. So all my other days are free. I think uh, this requires the moment to start. Uh, if you just put yourself in a way that you want these things in this way, they can make it happen. And other thing I said, the, all the admin people, like talking to the provost and the dean, uh, uh, sure, I cannot change their time. So I have to just find out like, okay, what are the day I am going to meet them? So I just keep those hours open. Uh, and so this is pretty much I do. Uh, but also I think I, I go and demand people that can you do it for me like this a lot. Thank you. I am so impressed and inspired and also scared. And now the third question is that now you have started your lab, what would you have done differently, especially during the postdoc time to be better, so that you can be better prepared for your PI position? Let's see, if we're still going in the same order, um, I have a short response on this one. Um, I, I think that um, on in retrospect, I was really, um, you know, urgent to leave my postdoc. I thought it was like, oh my gosh, this is this transitory period. I hate it. Um, but really, I think that I, I left my postdoc a little underbaked, if I if I can be uh, like frank about it, um, and that I I really could have benefited from from spending a little more time in my postdoc, sort of like working out those first protocols that were in my mind. Um, you know, making sure about the physical resources and like how they should be used, like what sort of equipment would allow us to do this. Um, and, um, you know, doing some of the preliminary work um, for project ideas that, you know, I had, I just hadn't really done anything or identified, you know, specific resources, like what specific lines or specific whatever genetics to, to use. Um, and I feel like, yeah, my first couple years here have been, um, you know, making that sort of foundational learning that like maybe I could have done, you know, one day a week for a year or whatever as as a postdoc um, and had undisturbed time to do that. So I think that those special resources that um, especially genetic lines or uh, specific strains, antibodies, whatever, that sort of stuff, um, very, very valuable as a PI. And if you have the freedom to, to develop those things as a postdoc that will really set you apart from others who are starting uh, from nothing like my naive self. Mine's also super short. Um, I think I had a, I had a COVID postdoc, so it was like kind of remote and short, and um, but it was awesome. I feel like I got so lucky. I My suggestion would be to, I was really happy that I branched out a bit and didn't go to a lab that was like a sister lab of my PhD lab, which I was really considering for a while because I love what I do. And I was like, yeah, it'd be great. I'll just work with another awesome blown physiologist. Um, but I ended up going to a more ecological lab to because that's why like I, I'm passionate about the intersection of physiology and climate change. And that was awesome. Like I felt like it helped me. It like gave me more breath, which honestly was super useful for teaching and like coming up with research ideas and just, yeah, like I think the breath was helpful. And like, I think depth would have also been helpful, I'm sure. But like at a PUI specifically, like I think breath was a good call. And, and then you just make more connections that are like a little bit outside of your community. Like I made more like eco ecological networking friendships and um, partnerships which is great for me. And I, I like, we've been writing a lot of grants together and it's been really fruitful to kind of like jump across a little bit and not just stay in the same niche. Um, not to say that wouldn't also be great, but I'm just saying that my experience, I really enjoyed it and really happy with it. Um, yeah, I also have a pretty short answer to this. Um, so I actually jumped from a plant lab to a Drosophila lab for my postdoc um, because I wanted to learn um, specific genetic techniques. Uh, unfortunately, I also had a COVID postdoc, but it was not COVID when I joined that postdoc lab. So I did not 
get those experiences. But nonetheless, being in a really intellectually different lab was really useful because now I feel like actually, um, you know, I get asked and I'm sort of expected to know the field of evolution so broadly and with such depth that like, I've never been asked these, you know, like one day I might explain a G matrix to someone. And then the next day I have to talk about like sexual conflict, like really different topics. And you kind of have to be the expert in these things. And so um, forcing yourself to grow intellectually is a really useful thing. I think also, um, you know, much like Sam, I also was sort of um, on the hustle and um, really wanted to be productive to finish things, get things out. And I wasn't necessarily spending a lot of time thinking about like how do I want to grow and learn in this postdoc and like affording myself the time um to actually just take time to learn a new skill um so you know I think I would encourage people to try to um if there's a skill set they really want to learn or improve upon that this is the time to do it um and then also you know especially if you're in a position where you have um, a bit of time before you start your position, but you're still in a postdoc, it's a really good time to sort of like sit down and really have a good think about what's the first grant you're going to write. And you probably had to do that for a chop, chalk talk or your research statement or whatever else. Um, but now's the time where you sit down and say like, okay, if I'm going to write that grant, what are the data that I need in order to submit that grant? And what are those, can I, collect any of those data now? Or what's the game plan for collecting those data when I first start so that I can, you know, get my first grant out the door um, in a, a timely manner. And similarly, also thinking about your first lab paper, just trying to think about what are the components that are going to go into that? What's the timeline going to look like? Um, I don't think I did that very well. And it's harder to do in hindsight. Um. <laughs> Yeah, also like when I was a postdoc, I had a really good intellectual wavelength matching with my other postdoc who was like two years uh, in front of me. And also my PI was also a new PI. So the great thing was that I could see what it takes to build a lab, hiring the people and all sorts of things. At the same time, the, the senior postdoc in the lab, I could see him, how he was preparing for the job market. So all of this thing actually made me aware that, uh, okay, what I need to do. Uh, but I always used to tell my uh, postdoc advisor, I want to be the forever postdoc because it's very tension free life. I just go to the lab, do the work, if it doesn't work, it's, it's still fine, and then go back home. Uh, but now I have to actually think about, oh, if it doesn't work, I have to make it work, uh, and also training people and so many other things. Uh, one of the things when I was grad school, um, I was pretty uh, interested to go to Phil Benfus lab, and I met him in the conference, and he gave me one of the very important pieces of advice. He said that, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be assistant professor. He said that you should probably work with an assistant professor who will be available so you can learn all the details. Uh, and that is, the, I think the best advice changed my career trajectories a lot. And I find that Bill, if you just give me an empty room, I can build a lab pretty quickly. Uh, the reason is that um, I was in, when I was a grad student and also postdoc, we never had the lab tech in kind of lab I worked. So I know how to purchase everything in the cheapest way, manage everything. Uh, so I felt that that is kind of my uh, biggest power. And if I had a chance to go back, I'd do the exactly same thing. It was hard, it was time consuming, but I, I like to do and know all the process and details. Thank you, thank you everyone. So the next question, and I'm gonna put it in the chat, is what was the most surprising challenge? And why and how did you address it or, or how are you still addressing it? Right. So it's most surprising. Well, um, I, I think that, you know, everyone everyone says this, but I guess the, to me it was surprising how much is true. Um, so everyone says that, oh, everyone that you interact with in your lab will need different mentorship from you and you're going to have to be a different person for each person. Um, and um, I didn't really believe it, but wow, it's true times like a billion. Um, and that, um, yeah, uh, supervising trainees and, and teaching can have lots of ups and downs. And you, you just prepare yourself to be uh, like both amazed and horrified, like on the regular, perhaps even in the same sentence or the same hour, the same presentation. 
Um, and um, I think I, I'm really, really quite surprised by that. And um, to to sort of work through that a little bit more, I've been asking a lot of advice about being a teacher, about being a mentor. Um, and so, you know, there, there are established mentoring uh, systems um, and, you know, workshops, I'm sure your institution will have tons of them if you're, if you're interested and it fits into that, um, you know, uh, important aspect of your, your matrix. Um, but um, um, I don't know, I read a lot of self-help blogs and books um, and uh, ask a lot of people for advice. And I really don't hesitate to not follow their advice, um, which I think is, it's very important as a postdoc, but it becomes even more important as a faculty member, as long as you know is still on the legal side of of um, of what you can do. Um, that well, if you meet someone and they seem like they're a terrible advisor and they give you some advice, you're like, hmm, I don't know that I want to do that. Then that's fine. Just don't do that and and shape your life around that advice. You know, it's like I'm not going to do that and I'm not going to be that advisor. But um, yeah, so then advising really is. Um, um, much more challenging and much more multifaceted than I expected. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, and another thing I could add um, is the hiring part and like knowing who to hire has been really hard for me. Like I, cause I want to be doing best practices, but we're so overwhelmed. We don't, have, I don't feel like I have time to learn best practices and like, it's all really quick and happening really fast. And that I found really overwhelming, especially like in the context of trying to be like inclusive and mindful about the diversity in my lab. And like, um, and so that's one thing. And I guess the way that I'm solving it is by trying to go slower. Like the first couple of hires I did, at, which I got super lucky on, but it genuinely feels like luck at this point that like, I think going slower and being more intentional and like talking to HR or, or talking to like, your office of equity and inclusion, like what are best practices for hiring, like sending questions ahead of time, like having someone else in the room with you, like these things that they have answers to and just kind of leaning on that. So, and then relatedly, um, just this idea that there's so many, many decisions we're making all the time that allow bias to slip in, like even like something as small as like, we have a wait list for the class and you're just in charge of picking who gets off the wait list and there's no system for it. And so it's like, you can see how bias could creep in there. And there's all these tiny little decisions all the time that you're making that aren't like talked about as like the, in, in, in the same way, the bigger decisions are talked about in terms of trying to do it from like an equitable or justice minded perspective. And so I think those like trying to flag those mini decisions and trying to be mindful about them has been really hard. Um, but also I think important. So in that part of the matrix, urgent and important. Um, and I think, again, the way I'm doing that is just trying to read up and read the literature and like figure out like what are the best practices for doing these things in a mindful way. But yeah, I think just like the surplus of decisions you have to make all the time can make you lean in to your bias and trying not to do that. Yeah, definitely echoing everything that's been said so far. Um, I think for me, the biggest challenge has been several aspects of management. And part of that does tie into how to be a good mentor to people. Um, but part of it is also the realization that um, this power shift happens like in immediately. So I know some of you in this chat, um, and if you've ever met me before, you probably are aware that I'm like an incredibly goofy, uh, like lighthearted, casual human. Um, but your students will not think of you that way. You, In fact, even it doesn't matter how friendly and kind you are from the bat, your students will be like low key, a little nervous around you, if not outright terrified. And um, it takes a lot of time to like build that relationship. And there might be interactions where you're like, whoa, that was weird. Like, where did that come from? And the realization that like actually building a lab and interacting with undergrads and interacting with all of these folks who are junior to you is really a lesson in like patience and like realizing that there's just a lot of anxiety in academia and um, trying to navigate those relationships will also like just being mindful of this sort of immediate power that you are are given when you step into this role um, 
that was really hard for me to understand. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's good to be really mindful of that. And I, I think the other thing that's related to this um, is stress management. So I also, I mean, you know, I say these things of like, wow, I was so surprised that people are so anxious as someone who is also very anxious. Like, I don't know why that was so surprising to me, but um, here we are. Uh, but I feel like, you know, as a postdoc and a grad student, I'd figured out ways to manage my stress. Um, and as a PI, it was really easy to just keep putting those aside to deal with all of these other things, the sort of onslaught of decisions that need to be made and other sort of stressful things. Um, but, you know, I think now in year two, I've really realized how important it is to like think of a routine and stick to it and prioritize it. So like, actually for me, I've realized that like, I just need to exercise like several times a week and then I'm a much happier critter. And so like, I just put it in my calendar before the semester even starts. Like I'm working out this morning, this morning and this morning and we're not having any meetings. And yes, I will be coming in at 10 instead of at nine. Um, and that uh, I think has been really useful for, for me. Yeah, I'll say uh, we'd add on that all of this. I think the most surprising part is how difficult hiring can be. And also, as Sam mentioned, it requires very customized, independent, individualistic mentoring plan. So I made a mistake. I put an advertisement for the graduate student hiring, and I was flooded with many bad applications. And I lost kind of two, three weeks just to go into because some of these things are not very specific. So and uh, I, I can talk more about the hiring thing. But one of the things I found that uh, the mentoring plan, uh, that everyone is so different. Uh, for somebody, you just look at their eyes and they, they will understand what you want to say. For someone, you have to keep talking for an hour to make your point, right? And then, um, so one of the surprising things I always tell people that I learned about my lab people more outside of the lab. Uh, because whenever I think we go out to eat and stuff, that is the time we talk a lot. And that is the time actually helped me to understand uh, that oh, what they're going through and what is the best practice for them, how I should communicate with them. And one of the things we should need to remember, I think no one will be as passionate as you are about your research. So don't expect that. And once you just load that expectation, it gets easier because they need few years to be that passionate like you, right? Like you probably think that, oh, I close my eyes and I sell device. It is not going to happen for them for the first week. Uh, so give them that time to sync with you, to get excited and uh, be as nerd as you are. Uh, so I think everyone needs a little bit very different mentoring plan. Uh, be mindful about that. Thank you very much. So now we move on to our last prepared question, but uh, some of you already touched on, upon this. So if you just want to uh, quickly add a little bit more, if anything comes to mind, is the is just best practices for recruiting. Like how how do you find people to join your group? Great. Yes, we have heard a, a bit about the this conundrum here. I think that a lot of us enter into our positions um, being um, very interested in providing the maximum number of opportunities to the sort of um, the maximum number and different types of individuals. Um, but I think it's a really um, sort of stark reality once you start your group that it's like, wow, actually, I have very limited effort that I can give. Everyone's really busy all the time. And um, it, it's not uh, it's not really possible to to be everything to everyone. Um, and so recruiting becomes a very sort of careful um, process. Um, and I think it's also very different than in the business world in that in academia, well, uh, there's really very few guilt free ways of of parting ways with someone, right? So then if someone is is if you commit to recruiting someone to your lab, that is a a pretty long-term commitment, even if you want to terminate that commitment, that's probably a, a year or more of, of maybe some sour feelings, which is really not very good for the group as a, as a whole. Um, and so um, I think that it's really very important to have a lot of exposure to the people that you're, you're trying to recruit, you know, at least meeting on Zoom and exchanging emails um, in a variety of very specific ways. Like if you're if you're sort of worried about someone's writing, then, you know, exchange information in a way that you can get a sense of, of their writing um, and really 
collect that information and then make judgment on it. I, I think that that's something that I was a very afraid to do for a while is to, to see negative aspects of, of people that I was interviewing. I really wanted to only see the optimistic sort of positive opportunity. But I think that um, uh, as you're recruiting, you really have to um, be critical um, and think about opportunity costs that it's like, well, if you, spend a few years with someone who's the wrong person, that's a few years that you could have spent with someone who really could flourish and, and blossom in your group. And, and that's really um, a waste, a, a shame to, to waste that effort. Um, and, but that being said, I, I still um, really recruit based on what I perceive as long-term opportunity and kind of like a scholastic vibe, I guess, rather than specific skills. I still think that skills, you know, like, it's great if you have some familiarity, but, um, you know, I think possibly really well-trained squirrels could do the type of work that I do. Um, but um, it's really, I think, very impossible to teach someone to be curious and enthusiastic. Um, it's still a question of whether they'll find your exact topic curious and a source of enthusiasm. Um, but um, if someone is just not expressing curiosity and enthusiasm in a way that you understand, or if you can't adjust to the way that they, they have that expression, then you're always going to be wondering like, do they like this? Do they not like this? Is this a bummer? Um, and that um, can be a source of a lot of negativity for you. Um, and in the past, I also tried to um, not pay much attention to letters of recommendation or reputation as potentially a source of bias. And they certainly are. But um, I think that those testimonials can be really great ways of finding good qualities. So I'm not sure I, I trust them necessarily for, for bad qualities or reading in between the lines. That's really potentially problematic. But I think that those letters of rec are just wonderful for finding out truly what is the best thing about someone. Um, and if that matches what you perceive as like, wow, this is a really strong part of this person. Well, then that's great. That's perfect. Um, I think that the bad quality is really hard to gauge, um, but I think that, um, you know, listening to the information that you collect and actually following it, like, oh, instead of just like, oh, no, they were just having a bad day or, oh, no, I'm sure that they can learn to do this. Like really thinking like, hmm, maybe, maybe that's real um, uh, and maybe that's a deal breaker for me. And then following that is, is very important and will save you a lot of struggle in the long run. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of if, any, if I have anything else to add. I think one thing that has come up with me, and it is something Sam said made me think about it, is this idea of enthusiasm. And like, I am a very enthusiastic person, and I usually seek that out in others who I'm around. Um, but I came up against a tricky situation, that, and I'll keep it as broad as possible, where like, I had someone that I was interacting with who was engaged with um, either me through teaching or advising and um, they got depressed and like they're dealing with mental health issues. And then I was kind of like, oh no, like am I horrible mentor? Like kind of trying to understand what enthusiasm can look like and how it can look different at different points in a person's trajectory and like trying to be mindful of that. It was really hard. And it was like, luckily, like Jen was saying earlier, like we built up growth mindset and like care and compassion in the lab. And so we could have a really honest conversation about it. Cause I just kept being like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And then they're like, no, no, it's not you. <laughs> and then we had to have this really serious conversation. And I don't know what to do about that in terms of like recruiting or thinking about like how to assess these things. I think having a lot of different approaches, it's like Sam and everyone has also been mentioning about like these individualized approaches to different individuals. Um, that's been really, I think, eye-opening for me. And I don't think I have a solution, but just something to like keep in mind when assessing people. Yeah, definitely um, agreeing with, with both of y'all as well. Um, you know, I think I also, like Sam, have sort of leaned towards people who are curious and are able to formulate a question. Um, you know, I'm thinking specifically for like postdocs and graduate students, like a question that's relevant to my lab and a question that like 
shows a clear connection that they know what we do and um, that they're interested in actually being part of the team and not just like being part of Yale, which is something that I get a lot. Um, the undergrads, of course, one is much more flexible. Like I, there's a lot of undergrads in the lab who are just like, I think plants are cool and I've got some growing on my windowsill. And I'm like, great, come join us. That sounds awesome. Um, but it is really challenging is really challenging to evaluate people is also really challenging to evaluate people while also trying to maintain um sort of inclusive mindsets and not just hiring people who uh you relate to or can get along with or are similar to in other aspects and that's something that um i think will be challenging for the rest of my career just like thinking of ways that are um slightly more objective or at least slightly more objective to like how that person might fit into the lab and so um the like combination of people who can ask a question um can see themselves and their future as part of the team and then also um I am like pretty uh firm about hiring people who are just like kind people and I've been very lucky on that front like my lab group is awesome everyone is fantastic and I think that's really helped the lab dynamic as well as, um, but it's hard to gauge. So like, I, you know, sorry, this is sort of a rambly answer that is not a lot of information. But. I'll echo with many of the points already mentioned. I think like there are uh, so many uh, trainable skills. I, I really don't worry about those things because we can teach those. Uh, but there is a huge part of that. Uh, some point mentioned about curiosity. I, I I look for someone who's focused. So I'll give an example. So when I was a postdoc, um, I was in May's meeting a year before. And then I met an undergrad and I found that she's very focused. She said that, oh, I want to grad school and do the plant stuff. And um, after that, we keep in touch. And later on, actually, I got this job offer and I was thinking about her. Okay. Who is the person I met or know is very focused? And then I texted her, okay, I got a position. Do you want to work with me? And then we talked and then she she is now my lab tech. So one of the reasons is that I'm teaching her the stuff and probably she has some experience, but uh, the focus is something very important. And sometimes when you're part of the a department like biology, say everyone is pre-med, so you train them, but their focus is not doing on the plan. So they're not as involved or invested like that. Other thing, I saw a question, I'll just uh, go through to answer that because it's kind of related. Um, the, what is the individual mentoring plan? So one of the thing I usually tell my mentee that, look, am I the best mentor? Absolutely not. Are you the best mentee? Probably not. But together, we are the best mentor and mentee combination. Can you do that? So on that case, like they feel like that, oh, I have to make sure that I make a progress and make Arif proud. And also I want to make sure that they do their best. So it is kind of most of the time it's uh, pretty much team of all, I should say. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, they have a very different priority. So on that case, like probably it is better to just to help them to go on that direction, uh, not to just hold them to walk to your direction. Thank you. Okay, now we're almost up to an hour, but we only have a few questions in the chat. One of them is being answered already, so we can do a rapid fire round, and we we don't have to like not all of you guys can have to answer. So I will just raise a question, and any of you can jump in. And the first one is how to initiate collaboration within the department, and then to balance between independent work and the collaboration. Great, I can I can hop in here. So um, I think it really depends on the the environment of your department, and I don't think that you should be uh, ashamed to ask how you'll be evaluated um, on collaboration. Um, you know, some departments really require you to be the the last author, to be the driving uh, force behind everything that you do. Um, others do not. Um, so mine is one of those that um, it doesn't really matter what position you are in terms of authorship that will count. Um, and so then as long as you're sure that it's a win-win um, in your mind that it's furthering your research, then go for it. But if you're in a situation where, you know, that's not going to count towards your promotion, then maybe that falls off important um, and you have to just be really good at politely declining. Thank you. And we have a question about formulating personalized mentoring plan, which Arif just answered. So the next question is, 
What piece of advice would you give to aspiring plant scientists who are considering this career path? How a international botany graduate student came in understanding evolutionary biology will initiate his own lab. Some longer vision advices probably here. I think um, one thing that I would encourage folks to do, especially those who are in sort of the later stages of grad student um, studenthood and um, being a postdoc is that, you know, going on the market, especially if you're interested in a primarily research institution, you really have to form an identity about your research vision. Like you kind of have to be known for the thing. Like, you know, I think I'm known as like the conflict kid, which is a weird thing to say, but nonetheless, I think that is how I'm perceived in the world. And um, you know, I know Minya and others, you guys are doing a lot more workshopping on like how to do that in your research statement and distill that as an identity. But, um, you know, like as you're actually doing the work now as a grad student, um, I think really trying to figure out what are your keywords going to be? How are you going to pitch yourself uh, as that person? And then like, what are the papers that are kind of like the proof um, that you can do that work? Thank you. And we have one more new question just came in. What advice would you give for creating a publication pipeline? I'm not sure why it needs here, but. Can I? Oh, OK. So uh, I'll say that if I understand the question correctly, the publication pipeline, I think uh, one of the major issue is that like once you're transitioning to think very deeply uh, what can be possible in first year, second year. And one of the things I think it's a common pattern. I'm just talking for all the new PIs uh, that happens a lot. I see at least first one, among first one or two paper, there will be one review article. And I think that is pretty much a help to not to have that gap. And sometimes what happens that your postdoc work will be coming, but you will not be probably the corresponding author. That also happens a lot. But uh, to keep that pipeline going, you need to make sure by this time, those papers will probably fill one or two year. Can you have a similar kind of uh, article standard uh, coming up? And I think that uh, is super important to the very first thing I mentioned, that once you start the lab, just keep thinking about, oh, what is the basic things I need to produce the data? Because even if you hire people and they find that they're just opening the boxes, they will not be motivated out. Because the producing things actually helps a lot to see, oh, this is my figure one, figure two. Uh, and I, I think the publication record is definitely some drive and a lot of uh, free thinking uh, on that context. Thank you. And we will have one last question. And so how do you manage the changes in general life circumstances? Um, going from a temporary postdoc contract with meh pay to having to think about things like buying a house or retirement or whatever, while navigating the huge professional changes we've been talking about is definitely kind of scary to me right now. I completely agree with you. And I don't have an answer. So. <laughs> I can say a little bit that like when I got the job, there's like faculty rental housing. And so there were like things to kind of ease the transitions. But then some of my peers who also were faculty, like new hires bought a house immediately, but they were older and wiser than me. So I was like, no, no, I want to rent for a couple of years, put off those big decisions until later. And that really helps. Like I bought my house in my second year of teaching and I was like, I spent that. Yeah, thanks. No big deal. And, uh, but it took me like a year to be like, what is a mortgage? Like literally no idea. <laughs> but I learned over the course of a year. So I think there are some like stop gaps to help you with that, um, those big life things. Maybe I'll also just- hey. add, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Just really quickly, um, if you are getting a significant pay bump as a faculty, which you probably are, uh, you should not feel guilt about asking people, paying people to do things. That's a big thing I see of like, if you don't, if you're not someone who gets joy out of cleaning your house, just like pay someone very well to clean your house. That's totally okay. Again, you're like, you're just managing, right? Like you're just trying to survive everything. So like, feel good about that. 
Okay, we are exactly one hour, and thank you so much, our awesome four panelists. And you shared so much with us, and I personally have learned so so much. And thank you everyone for coming. And later we'll give uh, send out a survey from BSA and post the, the plan postdocs about the webinar, and please fill it out, give us some feedback. As I mentioned in the beginning, we have more webinars like this planned, so please stay tuned. Have a great day everyone.